In 1929, the United States was caught up in a stock market speculation fever. The number of millionaires in America was shooting up, and it seemed almost impossible not to make a profit. But like a speeding freight train hitting a mountainside, it all suddenly comes to a crashing halt in under 36 hours, beginning October 23rd, 1929. This is the famous Wall Street crash, a disaster that will trigger the worst recession America has ever seen and plunge the entire world into a global financial crisis. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism, and euphoria, and ultimately humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I am Indy Nidell. In our 1927 episode on the Roaring Twenties, we saw that the American economy was booming, a boom based largely on stock market speculation. The famous quote from John Raskob that every man ought to be rich, that we mentioned, serves as a basis for many Americans to pump their money into the stock market. But in the final hours of the trading day on October 23, 1929, a panic has set in on the trading floors of Wall Street. Everyone suddenly wants to sell their stocks, and prices are plummeting. In the final hour of the day, more than 2.6 million shares are sold, more than is usually traded in a whole day. Tomorrow, Black Thursday, will prove even more chaotic, and Wall Street will crash. People's fortunes are wiped out, and the dream of unlimited wealth is over. Although not many people at the time saw it coming, the American economy has not been healthy for quite a while. On the world stage, the economy isn't nearly as stable as it was before the Great War, where Europe and America had enjoyed uninterrupted growth in industrial output and trade. International cooperation, in economic terms at least, was high. World markets were relatively open, and exchange rates were stable, with currencies based on an agreed-upon gold standard. Britain was at the center of this. It was the primary lender on the money markets, and the fact that it was so reliant on imports for food and raw materials, as well as profitable trade from its colonies, meant that it was strongly committed to maintaining a stable economy. The war has changed everything. The European countries abandon the gold standard and take out huge loans to fund the massive costs of mobilization. Rampant inflation and unstable exchange rates follow. In the short term, this is good for America, as it's gone from being a debtor nation pre-1914 to a creditor nation, funding the Allies' massive wartime and post-wartime demands. However, it also means that the financial system is now hugely unstable. Gold standards are reintroduced in some countries, but things are no way near as uniform as before the war. In America, the struggling agricultural sector that we discussed in the Roaring Twenties episode is starting to drag down the economy as a whole. Prices are tumbling. Farmers are finding themselves facing debts they cannot pay. This has knock-on effects on national prices, income, and employment. The construction industry has been in decline since 1925. It gets worse in 1928, and again, now in 1929, industrial production is now falling. You see, the boom has primarily been sustained by Wall Street finances and not real equivalent growth in the actual economy. Also, the consumption side of the economy has been slowing down for a few years now. People have been borrowing cheap money to buy nice shiny things, sure, but the consumer credit frenzy is now catching up with people who are now seeing a large proportion of their income disappear into credit payments for luxury goods that don't add productive value to the economy. People have drained their personal savings, leaving them potentially vulnerable to economic shocks. But until October 1929, you would not know things were looking bad if you went by the stock market. Stock prices have enjoyed a dizzying climb throughout most of the 1920s. In 1924, the New York Times index of 25 industrial stocks was at 110. By January 1929, it had climbed to 338 and then 452 in September. Trading volume is massive, reaching 90 million shares in September 1928 and then increasing to 114.8 million in November. It is basically impossible to buy stock that does not shoot up in price and give you a paper fortune. It's important to note, however, that a lot of people are not actually being made rich in the sense of having actual money, because to do that, 
they'd actually have to sell their stock. In theory, that's easy, but because the market is always rising, people want to hang on to the stock as long as possible or invest even more to ensure maximum profit. The shooting prices are largely artificial, driven by the high demand through speculation rather than a real increase in companies' profitability. Nevertheless, optimism is high. Speculators buy up options for products years into the future, and ordinary people find it's easy to borrow money to finance their investments. This is called margin trading, and the basic idea of it is you buy up a large amount of shares using only a small amount of your own money and borrowing the rest. You then pay this back once you've sold your stock at a profit, taking the rest for yourself and earning what seems to be free money. Investors borrow the money from their brokers, who in turn borrow from the banks, creating a cycle of payments which relies heavily on continued growth. What this all means then is that wealth and prosperity are seemingly being created, but there is very little stable foundation. Excessive speculation, itself fueled by reckless credit, is fueling artificial growth in the market. It's only pure confidence in this stream that is driving the financial boom. The financial system in the 1920s is thus built on recklessness. Many investors are inexperienced, and even though bankers and financial executives should know better, the fact that they are so willingly giving out loans for margin accounts suggests that they are also caught up in the hysteria and assume that the markets will always rise. But some people did warn that the financial bubble was threatening to burst. The Federal Reserve Board, in charge of America's monetary policy, have been the most anxious about the financial markets. In an effort to dampen speculation, they raise rates slightly to rein in the easy money that's flowing, and in February 29, issue a warning that excessive amounts of the country's credit absorbed in speculative security loans was having detrimental effects on business and may impair its future. Whoa, heavy words may impair its future. Well, the essential problem the Fed faces is that any firm attempting to tame the frenzy will likely result in full-blown panic. As historian Gary Dean Best notes, the whole base on which this grotesque house of cards now rested, including the seven billion worth of broker loans, was the expectation that stock prices would continue to rise. Withdraw that likelihood and the market must inexorably collapse, wiping out millions of investors and in the process making much of the $7 billion unrecoverable. This paradox is not helped by hostility from some of the biggest figures in business and finance towards the Fed. In 1928, financial celebrities such as John Raskob, Billy Durant, and Charles Mitchell started to collaborate to keep the Fed at bay. Durant is close friends with newly elected President Hoover and has leaned heavily on him to get the Fed to stop their weak attempts at curbing speculation, reportedly interrupting an official dinner to denounce the board. Even in mid-1929, speculators are still fighting like tigers against restraining action, according to the New Republic, who seem to agree, adding, and why shouldn't they? The stakes are immense speculation now being a major industry. President Hoover himself has been critical of the bullish market during his tenure as Secretary of Commerce, often issuing pleas to rein in the speculation. He seems to have abandoned this position during his presidential campaign and chosen to sing along with the optimism of the time. On the campaign trail in the summer of 1928, he declared that, we in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in the history of any land. We shall soon, with the help of God, be in sight of the day when poverty will be banished from this nation. This suggests that to win the presidency, Hoover had to ignore his own warnings and go along with the reckless optimism of the time, pointing towards how little people saw what lay ahead. And, in fact, even with the benefit of hindsight, no one really knows exactly how the panic set in. The real economy is in recession since the summer, depressing the market slightly. Things falter a bit more in September when the well-known entrepreneur and investor Roger Babson warns that a crash is coming, and the market goes through the so-called Babson break. Ironically, 
And despite their weak efforts, the Fed's policy also contributes toward a break in the market. There is a further dip in early October as some prominent speculators begin to liquidate their stocks. This isn't ideal, but breaks such as these have happened before and they don't seem too serious. What most likely happened is that these little factors which depressed and confused the market meant that investors and brokers found it difficult to track their positions. People could not keep up with the volume of trade and started to panic that the market would falter. It's the laws of the stock market that becomes its own demise. The market will rise when people think it will rise, but if enough people think it will fall, then it will fall. And that tipping point comes Wednesday, October 23rd. As the sell panic is pretty broad, it also means no one wants to buy, further worsening the situation. This lack of demand pushes prices down, and the market is close to a free fall decline when the closing bells ring. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, an index of some of the biggest companies on the New York Stock Exchange, has dropped 7%, a massive dip for just one day. But it is the next day that will go into history as Black Thursday, that a sharp decline goes into a free fall plummet. A record-breaking 12 million shares are traded that day on Wall Street as the selling panic continues. The brokerage firms are literally swamped with sell orders, which only drives the panic further. People's stock fortunes are wiped out pretty much instantly, and rumors about suicides among prominent speculators start circulating. A London newspaper even reports that the streets of Manhattan are littered with the dead bodies of men who have jumped from their office windows. In truth, there are no reported suicides, but these frantic rumors only further the sell panic. Government officials and big bankers are now scrambling to rein in the galloping disaster. Some of the biggest bankers meet at JP Morgan's headquarters early on Friday. After a brief conference, they announced to the press that they believe the foundations of the market to be sound. The dip is a technical hitch rather than a fundamental break, and that good stocks are selling too low. The bankers know this is not really the case, but inject a substantial amount of money into the market, hoping this buying power will be emulated by smaller investors. It's estimated they pump in around $130 million into stable stocks like U.S. Steel, AT&T, General Electric. This partly stabilizes the market and reassuring words from Hoover that the nation was on a sound and prosperous basis helped to calm things down further. However, there are simply too many players involved and too much money at risk for anyone to really make much of an impact. Things are getting worse. On Monday, the market falls further. Radio Corporation America, RCA, one of the biggest companies on the New York Stock Exchange, has lost a third of its value, and U.S. Steel has lost around 15% of its. The New York Times estimates that the American markets have lost around $14 billion in value. And it's about to get even worse. Tuesday, October 29th, is another dark day. In fact, Black Tuesday proves to be the worst so far. Again, a record 16 million shares are sold. Margin accounts are now being wiped out and liquidated, adding to the selling frenzy. Floor traders are now becoming vocally angry at the big bankers who seem to be doing fine. And many are taking to selling stock way below its value as a form of revenge. Despite continued assurances, many big bankers know exactly what is happening and have looked to make a profit on it. Albert Wigan, the head of Chase Bank, saw an opportunity and began to sell his personal stocks short. In other words, speculating that they will decline in the following weeks. He shorts around 42,000 shares and earns over $4 million personally while he has been pumping his bank's money back into the market to try to stabilize it. To top it all off, he has ensured his earnings are tax-free by hiding his profits in Canadian shell companies. The panic will continue until around mid-November, when the market will finally stabilize at a much lower level. At the worst point of the panic, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has lost around 50% of its value. It rebounds slightly after the panic subsides, but not nearly close to pre-crash levels. One in every hundred Americans have now lost their investments, and for many, this was their entire life savings. 
and ordinary Americans are already facing the effects of the crash. There is a rush to call back loaned money abroad and cut credit as panic seizes creditors, and many smaller banks are also suffering straight away. They had relied on Wall Street to make profit on their depositors' money, and when they lost this, depositors go to withdraw their savings as quickly as possible. The truly devastating economic effects will take until 1930 to play out, but something that has immediately affected America is the psychological trauma. Wall Street and its promise of unlimited wealth has lost all credibility. Anti-modernists are bemoaning the anarchy of the free market, and Marxists are proclaiming the death of capitalism. The crash has amplified a mild downturn and shattered certainties about America's financial health. The psychological effects will live on for generations, and it is this that is the lasting impact on the world. For a decade, the world has been swinging between dissolution and hope, recession and boom, war and peace. But there was at least hope. Hope the swings into darkness would soon stop. It was the American boom that was the shining light, illuminating that hope. And now, despite that many economies, significantly the German economy, will quickly recover, that hope is shattered. Instead of fearing the darkness, many many people will now seek it out as a safe harbor in such uncertain times. And inside that darkness lurks a man from Austria that has now gotten fuel on his fiery agitation against the world's bankers that he wrongly imagines to be synonymous with the Jews. Now, to understand this crash, you have to also understand the boom that made it happen. In two episodes of this series, we explain that boom and its weaknesses in both the U.S. and Germany. They are clickable right here around me somewhere any minute now. You'll see. Our Time Ghost Army member for this episode is Gross Liesebos. Gross and the rest of the Time Ghost Army is what keeps us from financially crashing. So join him and help us create a history boom. And as they will later say. It's the economy, stupid. Cheers.